When I began writing professionally, the Kindle hadn't been released yet. Online publications had just sprouted up, but were still in the minority, and the iPod wasn't even a teenager. The publishing world was still mainly a paper-based business. Print books and print periodicals, both of which are expensive to produce simply because of the cost of the materials, the cost of shipping, and the massive quantities of returns, i.e. waste. These costs, and a need to make a profit, dictated the pricing of books. Whether hardcover, trade paperback, or mass market paperback, books had to be a certain price point just for the title to break even. And if you know publishing, very few books break even. Then came the ebook revolution. Huzzah! Huzzah? <sighs> Huzzah. Ebooks changed publishing in many ways, but one thing they especially changed was the pricing of books in a very big, big way. There have been countless articles, essays, lawsuits, and debates over the pricing of ebooks. Many see the price as too high, or too low, or irrelevant since ebooks are only zeros and ones, so they should really be free for everyone, right? Right? Wrong. So much wrong. Just like with all the arts, the writing profession is mythologized and misunderstood, to the point that the commodification of books that has gone on since the publishing industry began has now become so severe that 99 cents, the cost of a box of candy at Walmart, is considered perfectly acceptable pricing for an ebook, and people will get really mad if you try to say differently. Guess what? I'm going to say differently. So buckle up y'all and join me on this mad journey. It may not be super jump for joy fun, but at the very least, it's gonna be interesting. Welcome to Writing in Suburbia with Jake Bible. Hey y'all, just wanted to let you know that I have more than this podcast going on. I'm also publishing a weekly newsletter, as well as releasing chapters of novels, the original podcast recording of Dead Mech, the Friday Night Drabble Party, and so much more. Where is all this greatness? Go to jakebible.substack.com. That's jakebible.substack.com. You can subscribe for free and get plenty of cool stuff weekly. Or become a paid subscriber and get the first releases of novels and audiobooks before they go on sale. Full access to the Dead Mech podcast immediately instead of weekly installments. Access to the full archive and exclusive threads and discussions. Plus a ton of cool stuff I haven't even thought up yet. Head over to jakebible.substack.com and subscribe now. Again, welcome to Writing in Suburbia with Jake Bible. What is this podcast? It's a place where I talk about my career as a professional writer, my fiction, my dreams, my life and family, host other authors, eventually. Try out some new things and just be real for a moment. I promise not to get preachy, to always be kind, and to be 100% honest without hurting anyone. So, sit back and relax and prepare to be entertained. But... Before we get into the meat of the episode, how about some quick Jake Bible Fiction news? Welcome to the JBF News. First order of business is to let you all know that if you hear noises during this podcast, it's because my dog just had a tumor removed, so I have the office door open to keep an eye on him. That may not be news per se, but it's relevant, especially since he's 100% deaf and tends to bark loudly at the most random times. So fair warning, y'all, there could be dog noises. Such is the life of a full-time writer working from home which I think a lot of people listening right now can understand the working from home thing. Definitely. All right, moving on. 
Still waiting on the cover for Rogue Six. Once I have that baby, I'll be sure to share it online. Paid subscribers will get a first look. Then everyone else. Only fair. One thing I wanted to announce is that going forward, I'll be narrating all of my own audiobooks. Yes, this includes the next two Rogue novels. I love Andy's narration, believe me, but due to licensing and right stuff, I have to do it myself so I can release the audiobooks wide and also because I just can't afford to pay up front. I'll take a hit for it, I'm sure, but hopefully fans and listeners understand. And slowly but surely, I'll also be narrating some of my back catalog too, so everyone should be getting used to my voice. If you aren't already, by listening to this podcast and all the fun stuff that's dropped in it. Speaking of episodes dropping, this episode drops on Monday the 26th, which means it's the day before my birthday. I turn 47 on the 27th. Crazy. There's a nice discussion going on over in the threads at jakebible.substack.com. We're talking about TV shows we like and miss, uh, music scores, book adaptations, and so much more. Just a good old general discussion. Join in if you have a few minutes. Oh, and I will be dropping a short story or two for my paid subscribers probably in the next few weeks, so be on the lookout for that. And if you want to get in on that, then go to jakebible.substack.com and subscribe. Speaking of subscribing, in a way, if you're liking this podcast, please leave a review on your podcast app of choice. It helps bring up the visibility of this podcast. This way, others get to enjoy my insanity. We don't all want to be a little insane bubble. Let's spread the crazy, y'all. Oh, and I can't forget about the OG Dead Mech podcast re-release going down. Two episodes are in the podcast feed already, folks. Oh, and I was just on the Dead Robot Society this weekend, talking with fellow authors Paul Cooley and Terry Mixon. Go check that out. I'll include the link with all the other ones in the Substack show notes. And I think that's it for JBS for News. Thanks, y'all. I'm going to start this episode off with a huge disclaimer. I'm eternally grateful for my fans and for all the readers out there, whether you prefer ebooks, print books, or don't have a preference. Thank you for reading and know that what I'm about to say is not meant to be a rebuke in any way. I'm hoping it's enlightening and maybe opens some eyes to the realities behind what it takes to produce the books that you all love to read. So if at any point you find yourself getting angry or frustrated or upset over what I'm saying, please remember that this is not personally about you. I'm simply explaining the way this industry affects me. Come here. Let's hug it out. Do it. Hug me. Hug me. Ah, that's nice. Okay, disclaimer over. And the hug. The hug is over too. I'm sure a few of you are very glad about that. I think we need to start this conversation off with me making it perfectly clear that the commodification of books has been around since the dawn of publishing. But there is one point in publishing where it really began to accelerate. Let me take you back to a simpler time. A time where... Oh hell, simpler times never existed. Who am I kidding? Let's just go back to the dawn of pulp fiction, especially the pulp novels of the 1930s and the 1950s. Pulp novels were published using cheap paper pulp, hence the name. You know, that yellow, rough, thick paper that started to get that weird smell after a few years on the shelf. They were also called dime store novels, which you may have heard too, because they never made it to the upper echelons of book retailing. These novels were cranked out in mass quantity and then sold on spinner racks in five-and-dime stores, pharmacies, grocery stores, gas stations, etc. They literally cost a dime, some even only a nickel. These weren't Pulitzer Prize winners, but they also weren't all crap. Some of the 20th century's most lauded writers started or made their careers writing pulp novels. There are some amazing stories and novels that went straight from the writers' minds to the spinner racks, these books were designed to be cheap and disposable so that they can make room for the next batch. And the next batch. And the next batch. Pulp publishers made their money on volume. 
Yes, all publishing works on volume, but the pulp publishers were never expecting one of their titles to become a massive national bestseller that would create income that could help subsidize the novels that didn't sell. Nope, pulp publishers cranked out title after title. They looked at total volume across all titles as their goal, since who really cared about the individual titles themselves, right? It was all just sci-fi and horror and crime and westerns and romance and, well, erotica. Hell, the lesbian crime erotica genre alone was a huge seller. Seriously, that was a genre, and it was big. So, commodification of novels has been around for a very, very long time. But even with the mass market volume business model, there was still some respect for the writing profession. Some. Writers were considered professionals. They were artists. Even when pulp writers were portrayed in film and later in television, they had a certain mystique to them. I think what was understood was that not everyone could become a professional writer. It's hard freaking work, and it takes a lot of dedication to sit your ass down and crank out story after story after story. Trust me, I know. Not that I'm immortal and got my start back in the 1930s or anything, but because I have spent the past decade, and especially the years between 2013 and 2018, cranking out title after title in order to generate a living income. I wrote 50 novels in five years, so I know exactly what was going through those writers of yours minds. Fear. Yep, that's what was going through their minds. Complete, total, abject fear. Why? Because if they didn't keep the creation machine going and hit at least a minimum of sales, then their career in pulp writing was over. It really was that simple. If you don't sell, you don't have a career. Boom. Skip forward to the Kindle revolution in ebooks. Yes, I'm just skipping forward like that. None of us want to be here all day. What did the creation of the ebook market do to publishing? Well, it tore the gates off their hinges and suddenly allowed anyone and everyone to publish a novel and get it out there to the masses. Which is great. The grand democratization of publishing had finally happened. Right? Wrong. All it did was switch the gatekeeper from the agents and publishers to the online retailers. Hold on, hold on, you say. The online retailers didn't gatekeep. They let anyone and everyone publish. True, true. Except these retailers, especially with Amazon and their Kindle, control what gates were seen. They created algorithms that put certain titles front and center and shoved other titles to the back. Trust me. They not only were and are gatekeepers, but they were and are the worst of the lot. But let's move on from that. That's a whole other episode, one I plan on exploring in depth. Here's the other part of the grand democratization of publishing. They let anyone and everyone publish. Huzzah! No, not huzzah. Remember that part about the mystique of being a writer? The respect, however little it may have been, that writers were afforded back in the days of yore? Poof. Gone. Overnight, anyone and everyone that decided they wanted to be a writer could be a writer and publish their novel, which I have no problem with. If you put pen to paper, then you are a writer. Anyone who writes deserves to be called a writer. Except I also mentioned that part about hard freaking work and a lot of dedication. Yeah. That kind of went out the window. People started publishing their unedited, shitty-covered, absolute zero-business-being-published crap-ass novels. A shitstorm of horrible writing was unleashed on the public. And the public noticed. Everyone noticed. Yes, there was a massive pushback from traditional publishers. They excoriated the new generation of self-publishers. It didn't matter if the book had been edited or not, had a great cover or not, was written by an experienced writer or not, publishing stood up and shouted that it was all crap. And as I stated previously, the vast majority of it was crap. So they had a point. Again, the public noticed. And being the public, especially the American public, folks started to ask why ebooks cost so much if many ebooks were crap. Writers heard this outcry, and in order to entice readers to pick their novel over all the other crap out there, these writers started selling their novels for $2.99, $1.99, and the great magic price point of ebooks, dun, 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 
99 cents. It was a lot easier for readers to take a risk on an ebook if it cost less than a dollar. Why not check it out? Oh, and they did en masse. The super discounted ebook took off and self published writers began to trumpet about massive sales of 99 cent ebooks. This got the attention of other writers and even publishers, and soon 99 cents became the norm. Dear God. Now, there's a bright side to this. Amazon took note of this mass hysteria. And, wait, quick aside. Scratch that use of the word hysteria in that context. Hell, scratch using the word hysteria at all. Hystero is the root word of hysteria and hysterectomy. Yeah, it literally means uterus or womb. So hysteria is sexist as fuck. Don't use that word anymore. Seriously, just don't. All right, end of aside. Amazon took note of this mass stupidity and changed their royalty structure so that price points between $2.99 and $9.99 got a higher royalty. They saw this pricing as acceptable and appropriate for ebooks. Not too cheap, not too expensive. They Goldilocks the ebook market. That was nice of them, right? No, nice had nothing to do with it. They just weren't making enough money off of 99 cent ebooks. But it was too late and the damage had been done. Consumers got used to 99 cent ebooks, so when an ebook came out higher than that, or God forbid, higher than 9.99, people lost their shit. I mean it. They got really, really mad and started asking why ebooks should cost anything but 99 cents. Hell, they wanted to know why ebooks weren't just free, which is a later episode too. Free has its place, people. Trust me, my career was built on free. Anywho. Shit was lost because publishers and writers had the audacity to price an ebook above 99 cents. How dare they? Ebooks were only zeros and ones, right? They weren't made out of paper, so they didn't have that cost. You didn't have to worry about shipping or returns, so there weren't those costs. Ebooks should be cheap. Cheap! And now this episode really begins. All the words before were simply preamble. There are plenty of folks out there that have analyzed all of this. Folks with a lot more experience than me. But they aren't on this podcast now, are they? I'll make this quick and hopefully easy to understand. First, ebooks aren't just add-ons. They take different formatting, different covers, uploading to the many retail sites, different retail descriptions, since more can be said on a screen than on the back of a novel, and so on. And those are just the highlights. So the argument that ebooks don't cost anything to produce is bullshit. If you believe they cost nothing to produce, then get yourself right in the head, because you're wrong. I'll explain further. The way print publishing works is the hardcover comes out, which is the most expensive way to produce a book. Then after a year or so, the trade paperback comes out. Trade paperbacks are those books that are big like the hardcover, but don't have the hardcover or dust jacket. Then after the trade paperbacks come the mass paperbacks. These are the smaller paperbacks that most people think of when they think of paperbacks. The ones at airports and on spinner racks, which still exist, people. Spinner racks still exist. And everywhere else they can be placed for consumers to see and impulse buy. Each level of publishing has a price point, descending from the most expensive hardcover to the least expensive mass market paperback. Now, raise your hand if you think mass market paperbacks are the cheapest because they are cheaper to produce. Anyone? I I see some raised hands out there. In part... You hand raisers are correct, but only in part. You see, a major reason mass market paperbacks are cheap is because the publishing house has already made their money from hardcover sales and trade paperbacks. If they publish trades, not all do. Mass market paperbacks get published because they are gravy. Of course, there are publishers that release some novels straight to mass, but those are outliers. Here's the rub, y'all. The pricing of mass market paperbacks is the benchmark used to compare to the pricing of ebooks. I've seen it and heard it over and over and over again that since paperbacks cost around $5.99, then an ebook, which doesn't have printing costs, should be much, much cheaper. Except, and I'm saying that word a lot during this podcast, except that ebooks tend to come out at the same time as the hardcover. That means that the book itself hasn't had time to generate sales that weren't moving on to trade paperback, then on to mass market paperback. 
That means that the book itself hasn't had time to generate sales that weren't moving on to trade paperback, then on to mass market paperback. Not to mention self-published books or small press releases that are only available as eBooks, with maybe some print-on-demand availability of a paperback. There is no year or two years of revenue to offset the low price point. Does that make sense? I hope so, because it's a major issue folks need to think about. But let's take one more dive into pricing, specifically the 99 cent ebook price point. If you want to compare ebooks to pulp novels, and it isn't exactly a bad comparison, then we have to compare the pricing. Apples to apples, y'all. If a pulp novel cost 10 cents in 1935, then it would need to be priced at $1.97 today. Well, that's not too far off right. Except. Ebooks aren't on spinner racks and set next to a limited inventory of titles. Spinner racks can only hold anywhere from 20 to 50 titles on them, at the absolute most. That's a small pool of competition. Ebooks, on the other hand, have millions and millions of other titles to compete with. And before anyone tries to argue that the retailer home screen is the spinner rack, let's not forget about those mighty, mighty algorithms the retailers like Amazon use to decide which titles end up on their virtual spinner racks. Did you hear the air quotes? I hope so. Realistically, my titles aren't going to end up on that landing page. Folks will have to search. Search through millions and millions of other titles. Also, they use funky algorithms to specifically target readers with pre-chosen book titles. We don't all see the same titles when we visit Amazon. They <clears throat> curate titles for us, which narrows down the visibility even more. Like if a bookstore employee kept steering you away from one aisle and over to another without you asking them to or wanting them to. Not even close to apples to apples. And should we get into the work that goes into creating a title, even if it is only released as an ebook? Yes, we should. We'll use me as the example. I spend hours upon hours, days upon days, weeks upon weeks coming up with a story. I'm usually thinking about what I'm going to write next while I'm actively writing a different book. Then I have to sit down and write that puppy. I can write a 75,000 word novel in three weeks with one week extra for editing. From start to submission, four weeks and I'm done. If that's all I'm doing. Now, well, I have a podcast. I have audiobook narration and production. I have marketing. I have the actual work of publishing the novel. I have sales to check on, newsletters to write, and so, 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 so much more. It takes me at least eight weeks now to write a novel. But for simplicity's sake, let's say it takes me about 80 to 100 of actual in-my-seat, at-my-desk, physical writing hours to complete a novel. I think 100 is safe. Plus, it makes for easy math. And we all like easy math. If I sell my novel at 99 cents, then that means I make mm, 0.0099 cents per hour. Living the rich life. Of course, I'll sell more than one ebook. Real numbers time. From 2013 to 2016, I sold 13,000 copies of Zburbia. That should come out to $128.70 per hour, right? Who wouldn't want to make that? But at 100 hours, I would have made $1,287. How about we multiply that number by 50 titles just to make it easy? $64,350 over five years because I wrote 50 novels in five years. Is that a living wage? Not even close. So let's get real. 13,000 copies of Zburbia at $2.99 each comes to $38,870. Then deduct 30% as Amazon share and we get $27,209. Then deduct the 50% that my publisher takes and we have $13,604.50, which comes to $4,534.83 per year for Zburbia over three years. Yikes. Let's say I write 10 novels a year, which I did, and that's only $45,348.30 per year. Not the worst, but not the best salary, especially since I have to pay taxes on all of that, not to mention expenses that I have. Also, I was using Zburbia numbers as my base. That is one of my best-selling titles, so that $45,000 is best-case scenario. 
Do I need to tell you that a writing career is dominated by worst case scenario, not best? Well, it's true. It's a feast or famine profession. Heavy on the famine. Do we really need to run the numbers for a 99 cent price point? It'd drop my income down to $15,000 a year. That's it. $15,000 a year for the sale of about 43,000 ebooks. Raise your hand if you think ebooks are priced too high. Oh, I still see a couple raised hands because you think print sales boost my income, right? I make 95% of my living off ebooks. $15,000 a year, folks, at the 99 cent price point. I'll let that sink in for a minute. While that does sink in, how's about a super quick word from our sponsor? Which is me. I'm the sponsor. The spooky sponsor. Hello, booze, ghouls, non-binary, and non-living folks out there. Do you like zombies? Do you like mechs? Do you like post-apocalyptic wastelands filled with cults and cannibals and city-states and hundreds of thousands of the undead? Then you're gonna love dead mech. In the far, far future, dead mech asks the question, what happens when a mech pilot dies while piloting their 50-foot battle robot and then becomes a zombie? You get a dead mech. Dead Mech is available for free as an ebook, and you can find the link at jakebible.com. Want to listen for free? Then check out the re-release of the original podcast version of the novel, or sell me your soul. I mean, subscribe for free at jakebible.substack.com, and you'll get an episode each week delivered right to the podcast player of your choice. Hell, you may have already noticed an episode or two in this very feed. Don't want to wait each week? Then feel free to either become a paid subscriber at jakebible.substack.com and get all of the episodes at once, or go to jakebible.com and purchase the audiobook from the web store, or buy it from one of those giganto mega corporations. They have copies waiting for you, too. Remember, head to jakebible.com or jakebible.substack.com. You're gonna love it. Did you all have a moment to think about those numbers I shared while you listened to that amazing spooky commercial? So amazing. So amazing. Yeah, anyway, did you? Did you have a moment to think about those numbers? I hope so. Still think that 99 cents per ebook is a fair price? I'm sure some of you still do. No worries. Some folks think a $15 minimum wage is too much because it hurts mega corporation profits. There's just no reasoning with some folks. But hey, I don't want this to be a bummer episode, and I promise to always be kind. So, before I kick it over to the end credits, I wanted to just say thank you. No matter what you think about ebook pricing, I don't care, honestly. Just thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for reading. Thank you for being you and digging my insanity. Just one big thank you. Anyone want another hug? What, what, hey, where are you going? Come back. All right. I know how lucky and privileged I am to be a full-time writer, even if the reason I'm back to full-time is because I was laid off from my sales manager job. Do not, in any way, think I don't appreciate every single one of you. And whether the price point is $2.99, $3.99, $4.99, or just $0.99, I appreciate every single ebook sold. Y'all rock! Oh, and something to always remember, you can only fail if you quit. Life, writing, Everything is a long game, so keep at it. I'll talk to you next week. Cheers, y'all. Writing in Suburbia with Jake Bible is a Jake Bible Fiction LLC production, all rights reserved. All music is by Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com. 
Heaven has been a huge part of the podcast community for well over a decade now. So check him out and drop him some coin if you get a chance. Full credits are in the show notes. For all links to works and stuffs mentioned in the episode, please check out the show notes or head over to jakebible.substack.com. Thank you for listening. Cheers, y'all.